recording. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, now, uh, obviously, we finished Financial Peace uh, University. I know a few of you were with us for that. But I'm going to go back to teaching on one of the lessons of the day, at least for the time being. Um, Pastor Yeager is still teaching his Bible study on Joshua, if anybody's interested in that. He's going to probably keep doing that until he finishes the book of Joshua. So uh, today, we're going to go over the Old Testament lesson. And I'll explain that in just a minute um, after we have a prayer. So let's start with a prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we begin a new church year, we thank you for bringing us to your house and to your word and to your sacrament that we may constantly grow in our knowledge of your love for us through the coming of your sa our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to know that out of uh, mercy and grace, you sent Jesus to be our Savior, to fulfill uh, your, your greatest promise of all, and to fill us with hope, especially during this time uh, of the church year and during the, this time of uh, our uh, society life. Help us to, to, to remain strong in that hope and that knowledge that you are with us and watching over us and helping us, even in the midst of all of the struggles and challenges of this earthly life. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pin you. Pin me. Oh, there we go. So I'm on the big screen. You're on the big screen. So, Ron, we're no longer looking at you at the big screen. Big screen. That's a good thing, huh? All right. All right. I have my mask off, but I'm going to stay put right here in this chair. So I'm going to try and share a screen. We're going to go over the Old Testament lesson. The first Sunday in Advent, some of you may know, um, the, some of the church fathers appointed the gospel lesson to be um, the Palm Sunday text, Jesus coming into Jerusalem on, on Palm Sunday. And the thinking behind that, no doubt, was, you know, I wasn't there when they set the, the rotation of scripture lessons, but no doubt it's the coming of Jesus. Advent means to come. It's all about pre preparing for the coming celebration, the coming, the remembering of the coming of Jesus the first time as a babe. And so when was the most important event of Jesus coming was Palm Sunday. But I can also tell you that, that Pastor Cordokas and I, when uh, all those years when we were together, we always kind of mumbled about it. We said, we think Palm Sunday should be on Palm Sunday. <laughs> and it is also. So it's the, the text is used again on Palm Sunday. So uh, I usually preach on the Old Testament or Epistle lesson on, the, on Advent 1. I know Pastor Q did, too. I don't recall what uh, Pastor Yeager did. I think he preached last year. Um, so I'm going to go over the Old Testament lesson today rather than the Gospel lesson. The Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah chapter 64. Let me share my screen here. It's a good thing we've got Jerry here in case I can goof up something. Okay. Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. And uh, it really does tie in well with uh, the theme of Advent, of, of God coming. Um, you know, uh, I'm just going to read it through. Instead of reading the whole thing and then going back, I'm just going to start reading a verse or two at a time. So it starts out, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. As fire call. There goes Jerry. Or be a fire somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. Now, I find this uh, first uh, couple of verses here a bit ironic. Because what is it the people are asking for through Isaiah? That God would rend the heavens. Just think about opening up of heavens and God coming down. When do we see that happen in other places? Well, a number of places, I suppose. We see when Stephen is being martyred, the heavens are opened and he can see right into heaven, right? Um, you, would, you, you might say a few times when God came down from heaven... He came down and the mountains quaked at his presence. I'm thinking like uh, Mount Sinai when he gave the Ten Commandments. And the people were afraid. They saw the smoke and the fire and the rumbling on the top of the mountain with Moses. And they were afraid. Uh, so there's another case. Usually, you would associate Almighty God 
coming down to earth with some great t tremors and terrors and and um, earthquakes and you know the, the might of God is coming down to earth and you would expect that and the Old Testament people it's expected that too not only Mount Sinai but what else what did God do other mighty things he parted the Red Sea he um, uh, you know, he, he led them by, fi uh, by fire and a pillar of smoke through the desert. Uh, or I'm thinking um, when they went into the promised land and conquered Jericho, what did they do? Mar march around the city and blow their trumpets and the walls fell down. God does mighty acts. That's what they expected. That's what they wanted. And so here we're asking God, God, come down, rend the heavens and come down. And when you come down, the mountains will quake. Your presence will be known over all the world. Well, this is why I find this ironic, because certainly that will happen on the last day, on Judgment Day, when Jesus comes again, his final advent. Everyone around the world will instantly know. I tell people that when there, you know, there are some Christians uh, in various uh, denominations that have the mistaken belief that Jesus will come secretly, you know, part of their, their end times uh, uh, misinterpretation. Yeah, he'll sneak down. God, Jesus will come secretly. But no, the Bible doesn't say that. Gee, when Jesus comes again on the last day, it, everyone will see it. The mountains will quake. But when Jesus came in his first advent, when he was born in the manger, was it a mighty fanfare? There were some angels singing to some shepherds, but that was about it, wasn't it? There wasn't some great tremors and earthquakes and, you know, the creation itself was... Was, uh, was aware of what was going on. It was kind of quiet. It was qu kind of subtle. I don't know. Does God have a sense of humor in that way? You know, he comes down in the Old Testament, and pretty much every time in the Old Testament, there's a few exceptions, but pretty much every time in the Old Testament when God's presence was with his people, there were mighty things going on, uh, often scary things. But when Jesus came down, it was very quiet and very subtle. It's like he's, he did slip in. All right, so uh, God's people here in these first couple of verses are saying, God, come down to us. We want you here with us. Where are you? Maybe some of you have heard me say in other Bible studies, but the greatest fear of God's people in the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew people, in the Hebrew culture, their greatest fear was that God would be silent. They would rather hear from God in the form of punishment, that they were being punished, but know that God is there and he's still their God, even though they're being punished. They would rather that than not hear anything, than just hear silence. Uh, it was agonizing for the Hebrew culture for those 400 years in between the Testaments when there were no prophets, there was nobody proclaiming God's word. Yes, there was the ongoing priesthood, which was offering the sacrifices and all, but they, they were wondering, where is God? He promised to send us a Messiah. We haven't heard anything in 400 years. That was a, immensely troubling to them. So they want God, we want, often want God, to come down with a mighty shout. God, just make yourself known to the world. Then they'll know. All those, those non-believers out there, they'll believe if they see you come down in a mighty way. Well, that's not how God works. But the people are asking that the mountains might quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. Very quickly, brushwood is very dry kindling. So it lights very quickly and burns hot very quickly. So if you're a camper, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> there's how many times, Elliot, have we been uh, trying to light a fire and the wood's too wet? Or, you know, there's, there's some problem trying to get the fire, the fire going. Some of you who camp, you know how that is. Well, brush, brushwood uh, lights very quickly and, and burns very quickly because it's dry kindling. And so it quickly causes water to boil. So in other words, God, come down like that. Come down and make your presence known very suddenly and very obviously in a, in a very known way. To make your name known to your adversaries that the nations might tremble at your presence. This makes me think of an, a little bit of an example you know, they want people to, to say, this is, that, this is their God. Look at how mighty he is. And then, then God's people, their enemies, would tremble and quake. Look at their God. It makes me think of a little illustration of, uh, say, a young boy 
on the playground who's being bullied. And he doesn't like it. And he says, well, you better leave me alone or I'm going to go get my big brother. And the big brother is a football player who's, you know, strong and athletic and, you know, a half a dozen years older. And the big brother comes by and stands next to his little brother. And what does he have to do? He doesn't really have to do anything. Just his imposing massive presence standing next to his little brother and the bullies back off. You know, I'm making this up. This is a fictional story, but uh, it's just an illustration. That's what God's people want from God here. That's what they're saying. God, we're being picked on. Your adversaries are picking on. They're persecuting us. They're tormenting us. Come down with your mighty presence and it'll scare them away. So, uh, you know, we all, all, now is God that way? Is God mighty and, and awesome? Of course. But that's usually not how he reveals himself, is it? Verse three, when you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. They're, they're remembering some of those mighty deeds that have happened in the, in the past. Verse four, from of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. All right. Uh, there is no other God who has done the things that you have done, God. Now, is that true? Of course it's true, right? There were multiple gods. In fact, gods back then were generally geographic. So if you lived in a certain area, you expected this was your God, because that was the God of that area. And that kind of morphed into the Greek and Roman mythology later on. But uh, back even before those, those uh, uh, cultures, uh, the, the pagan people back at that time, they thought, well, God is confined to a space, a geography. And so that Hebrew God, he's God over that area. And uh, yet when their God comes down, uh, the, the mountains quake. Well, no other God, none of those other gods do awesome things like our God does, the Hebrew God. That's what the Hebrew people are thinking, the Israelites are thinking. So, you know, you, you other gods, you have those other gods, but they, they're... They're irrelevant. They don't do anything, which they didn't, of course, because they were false gods, right? They were idols. All right, so no other god, there is no other god like you. That's verse 4. Verse 5. You, might, you meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Now, I, I find this to be an interesting uh, verse as well right here, because God comes to those who work righteousness. Now, can any of us really do something righteous in our good deeds? They're always tainted by sin, right? And even if they aren't outwardly tainted by sin, they're inwardly tainted by sin because we often do them for maybe a selfish reason or, you know, just to make ourselves feel good. Or even if, they, even if we don't, on occasion, if we have a good deed that is not tainted by sin, yet we are sinful. And so that causes a problem, too. So who is it that is righteous? Who is it that works righteous? What does it mean in God's eyes to work righteousness? And I love this verse for that, because it says right there, those who remember you in your ways. That's what it means to work righteousness in God's eyes. Remember God and his ways. In other words, faith, trust in God, belief in God. By believing in God, by trusting in him, by having faith in him, you are doing the greatest work of righteousness in God's eyes. That's true righteousness. Remember um, in, the, in the New Testament, uh, let's see, where is it? Is it in Peter? He talks about uh, Abraham and the faith. Abraham is righteous. He's called righteous, but it's not because he did righteous things. It's because he believed the promises of God. That's what makes made Abraham righteous. Same thing for you. You are righteous when you believe in Jesus and you believe the promises of Jesus. That's what makes you righteous. Now, the second half of verse 5 is confusing, I have to tell you. So we'll spend a, you know, a couple minutes on this real quick. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. I don't like that translation at all. You were angry, God, and therefore we sinned? It makes it sound like we sin because God's angry. Actually, in the Hebrew, those two phrases there are simultaneous. 
And the, the, the phrase, uh, we sinned, along with the next part, in our sins we have been a long time and shall we be saved, this, this sentence, well, the second half of verse 5, this sentence, uh, the verb forms there it can be interpreted in one of three ways. A statement of fact, which is what the King James does, a question, which is what the ESV does here, uh, or the third one is um, a wish, which is probably the least likely proper translation of this. So the King James Version says, you were angry, we sinned. They're simultaneous events. It's a statement of fact. We sin and God is angry. When God is angry, and I shouldn't say when, God is angry and we sin. They happen, they're, they're, just, they're just statements is what it is. Well, it, would be easier if it was just the other way around. It would be easier if it was the other way around, right. But, you know, we're always sin. I mean, you know, we cannot be without sin. Yeah, that's right. And so regardless, you know, and, and, right. You know, it, you know, it only makes sense that God is angry, you know, when we're sinning. Yes, exactly right. When we're sinning, God is angry. Um, the so, English teacher wants to take the and out of there and put because. Well, and, and, and that would make more sense. we know that would make more sense. Now, the word and, that word's not there in the Hebrew. So it's really just, behold, you're angry, we sin. That's all that's in the Hebrew. So that's why that word and in there, I think the English translators in the ESV, that, that tends to confuse it a smidge. And if we put because in there, that's not really in there either, although that would make sense. God is angry because we sin. That would absolutely make sense. It's really just two statements of fact. It's just a statement. God is angry. Is our God an angry God? Yes, he's angry. We say all this time we have to fear God. Now, fear means two, two things. Yes, fear means reverence and awe, but fear also means be afraid because our God is angry against unrighteousness, sin, um, disobedience, all the rest. He is an angry God. We do have, we, we've lost that in the modern age, that God needs to be feared in the old-fashioned sense, be afraid of his punishment. He punishes. He does. Uh, and we sin. That's just another statement of fact. We sin. That's, that really is the cause of God's anger. And then in the next uh, phrase there, in our sins, we have been a long time. Is that true? Again, a statement of fact. It's kind of awkwardly said there in the ESV. Again, I, I don't know why the translators translated this exactly the way they did. But uh, we have been sinners a long time. Yeah, forever. Well, as humanity, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, of course. And shall we be saved? This is where I say, this is, and there's a number of places, the Hebrew language has some ambiguity to it, which is a good thing, generally. Because here, shall we be saved, can be translated either as, we shall be saved, so again, a statement, or a question, shall we be saved? Or a wish, I wish we will be saved. I hope we will be saved. A wish or a hope. So it can be translated in all three ways based on the verb there. Okay? Which is kind of good because do we hope to be saved? Yes. We wish to be saved? Yeah. Are we asking God? God, are you going to save us? Yeah, we ask God that. God's answer is yes. Here's my son. And that is a statement. We shall be saved. It's a statement of faith, really. So there's a triple ambiguity there, which is really kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, this, this verse is a little bit um, confusing, I think, just on the surface. If you just read it straight away, you were angry and we sinned. What exactly does that mean? And then in our sins, we have been a long time. Shall we be saved? That's a little clearer, and I think it's fine to uh, interpret it that way. Shall we be saved to ask God? But it's also meaning we shall be saved. God will save us. He has promised to save us. Those of you who uh, were in the early service or watched the early service, you know I, I talked about the very first promise God made back in Genesis chapter 3. You guys recognize that, right? Yeah. God, who was God talking to when he made that promise? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, right. And the snake. Right. 
Yeah. I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's actually very literally talking to, I mean, he talks to all three of them. After the first sin, he addresses the snake, then he addresses Eve, then he addresses Adam, right? And he says to the snake, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and your offspring. You, he shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. That is often called the proto-evangelium, which means the first gospel. Proto, uh, first. And evangeli evangelium is uh, pronounced, but uh, evan evangelical is, means gospel. So it's the very first gospel message that God gives to us. And what a great promise. It's right as soon as they sin, God gives them the gospel message. I'm going to send you a savior who's going to be a descendant of Adam and Eve, who is going to crush Satan's head. Now, in the, in the, at, at the same time, Satan is going to bruise his heel. So which is more serious? Your head, right? Crushing the head, right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Jane. So, you know, would it be fair to say probably then that, you know, God had no reason to be angry until, you know, Adam and Eve. Absolutely true, absolutely. And so that's where the anger yes. came in. God had no reason to be angry. He wasn't angry until sin, until Adam and Eve sinned. Absolutely right. Uh, back to crushing the head of the snake. I still remember one time uh, growing up, we had a big yard, and I did lawn care maintenance for two or three neighbors on either side as a teenager. That was kind of my job. And there was one point where the neighbor lady found a snake. She didn't like snakes. Who does? Yeah, who does? Right, right. <laughs> Well, some people are more scared of spiders or bees than snakes, but yeah, most everybody. I mean, who, who really likes the snakes, right? She asked me to come and, and kill it. So I took my shovel, I still remember this, and uh, it was a spade, so one of those flat shovels, and I, it had crawled out of the crawl space in the backyard, and I saw it. So I'm chasing it around, and I went to ch chop like that, and I just got the tail. Ugh. I got about four inches off the tail. Well, what do you think happened? Snake, snake kept scurrying about. It was just a garter snake. What did I have to do? I had to chop it right behind the head. You know, that's the way you kill a snake. So the, the first gospel message that the Savior, the Messiah, would crush his head is a sign to, is, is a mention, a reference to complete victory, complete dominance, crushing, killing Satan and all sin and all death. But uh, the fact that Satan will bruise his heel, well, in the process of crushing his head, he got bit in the heel, which is painful, but it's not deadly. Okay. So, I mean, it kind of makes sense, you know, kind of a, a, the, the way that God gives that first gospel message. It's interesting. Yeah, Denny. Kind of along with that, God probably wasn't real happy when the angels that fell away and became Satan yeah you know he probably wasn't overly excited about that either. yeah his anger may have started a little bit before adam and eve sinned when the angels fell away you're right we don't know how long that time period was but yes hard to understand when the, yeah, it's hard to understand those uh, those uh creation times but yes you're right he would have been angry with the uh, rebellious angels as well you betcha all right verse six go on a little bit oops let me just we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and all and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Uh, we all have become like one who is unclean. That was the worst thing you could be in the Hebrew culture. If you were unclean due to some uh, circumstance or event, you could not go in the temple. And by not being in the temple, you could not hear... God's word, you could not be with God's people in worship, you could not participate or observe the sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. So that was a big deal to be unclean. And in fact, you were isolated. Now, a few things made you unclean. If you touched a dead body, you were unclean. So the people who would bury a dead body would be unclean, and I think it was for a week. And then they would have to go through some minor ritual with a little sacrifice and then they would be clean again and they could rejoin the community of, of believers. So that was one thing. Another thing, and I'm not trying to pick on women, this is just what God said. 
back then, is that time of the month made you unclean for a week. And then you'd be clean again, and then you could rejoin the community of believers. So there was a week every month where women would not be allowed. And that's actually in, in the church service that are in the, in this, in this uh, um, temple. Uh, and that's actually what this is a reference to. Our English translators have done us the favor of making this a little more palatable, I think, to the modern ear. Because what this actually says, Hebrew is a bit crass, kind of like Martin Luther. If any of you have read Martin Luther or understand some of the German, he's very crass. <laughs> he called the Pope all kinds of names. Some of them would not be polite things that we would say in polite society today. Well, the Hebrew language is a bit crass as well. What this very literally says is we have all become like one who is unclean. Our righteous deeds are like menstrual rags. That's what it actually literally says in the Hebrew. Now, they didn't have the conveniences we have today for women. So they used rags and then would throw them away. They would not be able to be cleaned. And so that's what this is saying. Our righteous deeds, what we think are good deeds, are worth nothing more than being cast away, thrown away. That's all they're good for. They're so polluted that it's not even worth cleaning them. And I like the, the juxtaposition of that with the previous verse, because in the previous verse, what is it that truly is righteous? Remembering God and his ways. Believing in God, having faith and trust in God. That's true righteousness. Here, our deeds, see it actually used the words deeds. Our deeds are so polluted that they're just for throwing away. So even back in the Old Testament, they were talking faith, not works. Yes. And that's something a lot of churches miss. My mom asked me when we, we were just at her house over Thanksgiving, she asked me if, if you ever preach on the New Testament. I'm like, all the time, Mom. I was like, that's, that's that gospel. You know, we need it. Well, the pastor doesn't like the New Testament. She, and it's, she's a lady. Mm -hmm. and she, she preaches on the Old Testament all the time. When I was there in October and I, I streamed the service from here, and she was so excited because it was a New Testament. <laughs> oh, I get to hear the New Testament. So why does that pastor only teach on the Old Testament? She didn't like, she, Mom says she didn't like the Old Testament, or the New Testament. I don't know. Oh, I haven't, I've only been in church with her once. It was the most gospel message I've ever heard from her in a Methodist church in ever. Mm -hmm. But she, she just, she said she doesn't like it, so huh. she doesn't preach on it. Well, there is the mistaken notion among some, um, you know, some Christians that the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is gospel. And the Old Testament is where God tells us, this is what you shall do and shall not do. And here's the Ten Commandments. And here's all the rites and rituals. And then the New Testament is just about Jesus. That's not really true. No, not, not at all true. There is a lot of gospel in the Old Testament, meaning... Faith, talk about faith and trust and belief in God as being really the true way you are saved. And here's some of it right here in um, Isaiah. And you can also find a lot of it in the Psalms. You can also find a lot of it back in the, uh, the first five books of the Bible in Genesis. God talks about faith there too. And conversely, in the New Testament, yes, a, big, uh, a majority of the New Testament is about Jesus and having faith in him. But there's also some law there. Paul talks about you know, this is what you shall do, love your neighbor, and take care of one another, and give your tithes, and do, you know, this kind of thing. So Paul gives a lot of instruction in his letters as well about what we are to do and not do as Christians. So there's law and gospel in both Testaments. And yes, it's all coherent. You're absolutely right, Terry, that even in the Old Testament, it's talk about faith. Right here, our, what we think are righteous deeds are nothing better than polluted garments to be thrown away. True righteousness is remembering God and his ways, right there. It can't be more clear right here. I mean, the, the word righteous is there in both places. Uh, so I, I really like these couple of verses together, even though they are a little bit hard to understand, I think. All right, then the uh, rest of verse 6. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. What, what a great time of year to be reading that, right? Our... Um, 
our iniquities cause us to be like a dried up shriveled leaf in front of God. And the wind takes us away. Yeah, there's a great image there because, um, oh, a number of weeks ago, we had cleaned up the front yard of our lawn of leaves. But the neighbor next to us has an oak tree and the neighbor next to them has an oak tree. And you know, oak trees are late in dropping their leaves. We have two maples in our yard. The, all their leaves were down, we raked them all up, bagged them, put them in the yard waste. Some of them we came and dumped up here in the, uh, in the ravine. Don't tell anyone. Ron, you didn't hear that, right? I know, you, you've told me that's okay, Ron. <laughs> and then, like two weeks later, which would have been like a week or two ago, the oak, the oak trees, two of them and the next two neighbors, uh, a, a bunch of their leaves were dropping and now I got leaves in my yard again. But I don't know if you guys remember about two weeks ago, we had some really nice weather and there was a point in there where there was kind of a bit of a windstorm. Oh, yeah. What, was it a Sunday? I don't remember, it was a couple weeks ago, but a strong wind came, it was blowing all day long. All those oak leaves in my, uh, in my yard, <laughs> Then I thought, I gotta rake them up again? They were gone. They had all blown away. I think about three doors down, they got all the leaves because there was, you know, something down there that caught the leaves. So they blew all the way down into the ravine or into the uh, against the fence or whatever. <laughs> I remember growing up, my dad used you usually say, you know, this was for the purpose of uh, preparing the lawn for winter, but he would say, the last lawn mowing you cut it a, a, a notch shorter mm -hmm. so that the lawn is okay for the winter. And he said, then you get the added bonus that all the leaves blow off of it. <laughs> <laughs> Into your neighbor's yard. <laughs> you know, growing up in the country, a, I mean, maybe it was just because I was a kid, but I mean, we had lots of trees, but I never ever remember, you know, raking leaves and jumping in them because they would just all away. They don't look good. You know, fields all around us. You sure. Know? And so I, I don't really ever remember breaking leaves. Well, you can have the joy of breaking leaves next fall at our house if you like. <laughs> or come up here to church well, and help. There's always yeah, a Sunday up here know, or a Saturday. As an adult, yeah. yes. I, as a kid, I don't ever remember that. <laughs> very good. Very good. All right. So that's what our, our sins do to us, our iniquities. They cause us to blow away. Away from what? Away from God. Oh, and that's, they separate us from God. That's the whole problem with sin, is it separates us from God, disobedience. God wants to be with us. He doesn't want us to sin. That's us turning our backs on him. Verse 7, there is no one who calls upon your name who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. Uh, first of all, that sounds a little bit like today, the first part of that. There is no one who calls upon your name who rouses himself to take hold of you. It was true back then, and it's true today, that a lot of people in their sin are separated from God, and they don't care. They don't rouse themselves to say, where is God in my life? They just don't care. It's, it's apathy that's taken over. Uh, no one calls upon your name. Now, of course, that's a bit of an exaggeration. There's always been some of God's people who do call upon his name. But there's often big chunks of society that just ignores God and doesn't care because of their sinfulness. And then the last uh, part of verse 7 here is uh, he, uh, Hebra Hebraism, Hebrewism. Uh, because for God to hide his face is uh, meaning uh, that has the meaning of like God is ashamed of our sins, so he's not going to look at us. That was, um, let's see, who was it? Uh, Noah. Do you remember when Noah came off the ark? What did he do? Built an built altar. altar. Yep, built an altar. After that, I have, I have something else in mind. I'm, I'm um, coaxing out of you. After that, it says he planted a vineyard. I taught, the reason I remember this, and because I, I studied it a, a smidge for my Bible study on wine. And as near as I could tell, and I didn't do an exhaustive search, I didn't do a dissertation on it or anything, but I searched the internet multiple times with different uh, uh, search uh, engines. The oldest literary reference to wine that I could find was that reference to Noah. 
coming off the ark. And after he built an altar, sacrificed to God, gave thanks to God, then it says, then he planted a vineyard and made wine. Wine is not mentioned in the Bible before that. And there are no older literary sources than that that mention wine either, that I could find anyway. So Noah... Um, well, there's not a whole lot of biblical history prior to Noah. You're right. It's just little snippets of, you know, and, and a genealogy. It's like chapter 5 of Genesis. Or something. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I have another question. Could the fading like a leaf and the wind taking us away, could that refer to death at all or only? Oh, that is a good question. I had not thought about that, but you're right. In our sin, we are separated from God. And if we don't care, if we don't rouse ourselves to, to look at God, to call upon his name, the wind just blows us away. Yes, that could be a reference to, to death. Very perceptive. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, back to my thought about hiding your face. Where I'm going with this is Noah got drunk. It's the first, uh, again, not only the first reference to wine, but the first reference to drunkenness. And it's referenced in a negative way. So it's not that wine is bad, it's that drunkenness is bad. But do you remember what happened when Noah got drunk? Sons. Yeah, one of his sons, which one? Ham, Ham? Was it Ham made fun of him? Well, he saw his nakedness. Yeah. The other two sons put a garment on themselves uh, between them and walked backwards to cover over Noah's nakedness so they weren't looking. See, to see someone doing something shameful, whether it's being naked, being drunk, engaged in some... Um, unethical or immoral behavior, to see someone is a, an act of shame in the Hebrew culture. I think we've lost that concept of shame in modern, in modern society, but it was shameful. So if somebody was doing something shameful, you would turn your face, you would not look at them. And that causes a separation between you. That's what this Hebraism is right here, that God is ashamed of us in our sin. So he turns his face away. God has hidden his face from us and therefore, we melt in our iniquities. Different analogy there. Instead of blowing away in our iniquities, now we melt in our iniquities. Um, but it's all because God is not looking at us. Again, that's a big deal to the Hebrews. Remember I said a little bit earlier, the, the, one of the biggest fears they had was that God would not speak to them. They wanted God to speak to them, even if it was in anger or punishment. They wanted to know God was there. To, be, to get the silent treatment was the worst thing for them. I so it still is, even in our modern society. <coughs> we don't like it when people won't speak to us. Yeah, right. And other times we don't like it when people speak too much to yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> Politics. <laughs> All right. So just a good little reference. Um, and that's often the case where uh, you'll, you'll see this in the Psalms, especially where there's the, the plea for God to look upon us, see us, to, to, to not turn his face from us, because that's a good thing. To have God look upon you means you are being blessed by God. To have God look away from you or turn his face from you means you're being ignored by God, which is a problem because then we're stuck in our sinfulness and our sinful ways. So we want God to look at us. There was a comment you made earlier that reminded me of what Joan told me yesterday when you talked about how God parted the Red Sea and they went through. And she was telling me that you know God parted the Red Sea. He didn't make the sea go away. Yeah. So the troubles, the danger, all of that tribulation is still there, but he lets us pass through. Yeah. And then those troubles or tribulations come back. So excellent. That was uh, when, you know when you had mentioned parting of the Red Sea. I mm -hmm. Yeah, very good, very good, absolutely. And and today with all the the troubles and trials of this uh, earthly life right now in our society, the pandemic, the the state of our nation, and the state of of Christianity. Yes, those troubles are there. God doesn't say, I'm going to take away those troubles. I'm not going to remove the Red Sea, but I will take you through them and you'll, you'll be with me and I'll be with you. I will be your people. 
I, I will, you will be my people and I will be your God. And that's a great comforting promise that God gives to us. You bet. All right, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. And we are all the work of your hand. What a great image there as well. Did God create everything? Absolutely. He created everything. And how did he create in the beginning? He just spoke with one exception. You know the exception? Man. Humanity, right? Mankind. And how did he create us? From the dust, right? From the dirt. He took the dirt. I don't know if he had to moisten it a little bit and put it on a potter's wheel and spin the wheel and then shape uh, humans out of it. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not that, but it's a nice image. So he shaped us and he made us and we are like the clay to a potter and God is our maker. We are the work of his hand. And it ends on this wonderful kind of uplifting note, this particular passage. Yeah, of course, Isaiah goes on. There's a few more chapters after this, but um, be not so terribly angry, O Lord. Remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look. We are all your people. So God, don't be so angry. Remember a few verses ago, God is angry. We talked about God being angry. Here, it's a plea to God. Please do not be angry. And they know the reason he's angry is uh, an iniquity, our iniquity. Remember not iniquity, any iniquity. Not just ours, but all iniquity that surrounds and consumes this earth. God, please don't be angry. Don't remember iniquity. That's a plea. And then God, please look. Turn your face to us. We want your presence in our life. For we are your people. That's basically, and we can do this as well today, that's basically reminding God of his promise that he made to us. God said, before this point, God said, I am your God, you are my people. That's a promise. I, I think I referenced that in my sermon today. That's a promise of God. There's nothing wrong, it happens throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, where God's people remind God, of his promise. God, you said. Well, does God forget his promises? No. No. So what's the point of reminding God? God, look, we are your people. You promised we are your people. What's the point of that? It's not to remind God. It's to remind us. That's right. It's to remind us. So when you're reminding, uh, when you think you're reminding God, there's nothing wrong with that. You're not really reminding God. You're reminding yourself. Isaiah is... You talked about the 400 years where God was silent. Uh, where was Isaiah in that regard? He was near the end of that. He was towards the end yeah. of that. Yeah, uh, well, right before that time. Is that what you mean? I'm asking you. Yeah. Um, I'd have to look at uh, my Bible timeline somewhere, pull out a Bible atlas. But I'm thinking Isaiah was maybe 200 years before that silent time. Uh, so there were a couple of generations after Isaiah where some of the minor prophets came about. And so they were still proclaiming God's word. But then it was soon thereafter, a couple of generations after Isaiah, that the prophets fell silent. There were no prophets. No one was prophesying about God. And that's when the so people... John the Baptist came then. And then John the Baptist came, and he was the first prophet in 400 years. And people flocked to him because they wanted to hear him. You know, he drew great crowds. Of course, he was a fire and brimstone type of preacher. And maybe that's part of what drew crowds. People know they need to hear that. So, um, yes, and, and that's where Jesus also said he's the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And the last of the Old Testament prophets was John the Baptist. Yeah, John the Baptist broke that 400-year silence. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, I'm about at the end of my notes and at the end of the uh, text, and we've got about, I don't know, 10 or 12 minutes left. Any questions or comments or discussion? Anyone online got any questions or comments you want to say? Go ahead, Bob. You were going to say something? No, I was just watching Dean. Oh, to do something. I don't know. All right. I'll unshare this real quick. There we go. I gotta look through my bifocals, that's why I do this. I don't have trifocals yet. Anybody have trifocals? No? All right. Hello. 
prism. You have a prism? Oh. Is that correct? Like a stigmatism or some kind of problem? Some yeah. kind of problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's games in there. Explain it. I think I would kind of summarize this Old Testament lesson in this way, especially as we begin a new church year and we begin Advent, that um, God's people were crying out for a mighty revelation of God. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down and the mountains would quake and our adversaries would know that you are there and that uh, every, you know, if you're like our big brother standing behind us, people would stop picking on us and persecuting us. Come down, come to us, God. Make your presence obvious and known. And how does God answer that? In a quiet little manger, in a quiet little stable, in a quiet little corner of the world called Bethlehem. Kind of interesting. It's a bit ironic, too. Uh, I think uh, that's how I would uh, talk about this. Um, that's how I would uh, summarize this, that it's pointing us to, to God's answer to prayer that uh, we want God to come among us. Now, I forgot Pastor Cordocus has signed in. Anything to add from your infinite wisdom there, my uh, predecessor? Well, my, my infinite wisdom is so much less than yours. Ah, not true. <laughs> I, I am glad that you, ha you had a chance to go to the Hebrew and um, help us out with that. You know, context is everything when you read Hebrew. Yeah. Um, but I will correct one thing. Okay. I actually, I actually, I actually like the Palm Sunday lesson for Advent one. Oh. In the uh, in Lutheran worship, you never got Palm Sunday. They took it away from Palm Sunday and made that Sunday of the Passion, and they took it away from. Um, advent one and made that simply more judgment well in my mind we just did three week, weeks of the end of the world i'm tired of that i want to move on so <laughs> that's why like you know there was an alternate uh, gospel lesson for today which yeah. encompassed the, the judgment so i'm glad you did the the palm sunday one all right well i stand corrected i i had remembered you and i both kind of saying well it's palm sunday on advent one i guess that was just me <laughs> uh, and I, don't yeah, have I think it was you. what part yeah i think it was you but yeah. <laughs> i uh, i'm happy if you say i agree with you that's fine all right I agree with you. all right very good well any last questions i guess i can wrap it up otherwise Happy New Year to everyone. Here we are. And it's good to, uh, I do like, uh, so I won't speak for Pastor Q here, but uh, I remember growing up and Advent was, remember the color? Purple. Purple. Because Advent was a penitential season, much like Lent. And then somewhere along the line, and again, maybe Pastor Q would remember, uh, I don't remember when our uh, synod started changing to blue. And we were probably following other churches or the Catholic Church. But blue is the color of hope. So as you heard in my sermon this morning, those of you who were here, I just talked about, I preached on hope. And I like that. It's an opportunity to preach on the hope we have as Christians. So it does make uh, Advent slightly different than Lent uh, by, by having the color blue and the, the focus on hope. Uh, Pastor Q, anything to add? When was uh, when did all that happen? No, you're right. Well, the, uh, the rest of the churches that came in you know, in the, in the, in the late, into the 60s and early 70s. And then when we got the blue hymnal, that's when it changed and our lessons changed. We went to the three-year lectionary. But originally, you're right, um, Advent started out as a penitential season. You know, John the Baptist starts his ministry with repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then um, Jesus first sermon is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand in mark especially but um and so purple and repentance that all went together but with the new lectionary they did exactly that they said you know we don't need two lengths and so let's change so repentance is still there as you 
you know, covered in the Old Testament lesson today, is still there in Advent, but they didn't, they wanted to distinguish it from another Lent. So you, you got that exactly right. So it's about 50 years ago. Okay. When it started, it caught up with us into the 80s. That sounds about right, because I think I was about confirmation age, which would have been 1980, actually, was when I was confirmed. That's about when I recall sometime right around the years when purple became blue in Advent in Lutheran churches. All right. Because a lot of your Fort Wayne buddies want it to be purple. <laughs> All right. Well, let's close with prayer, and then we'll be done. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the uh, advent of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, for his first advent on Christmas, for his continuing advent among us now through word and sacrament, and through his future advent when he will come again. We ask that you help us all to prepare during this season to be ready for the celebration yet again of his birth on Christmas, and uh, help us all to remember our sinfulness and our iniquity, to repent of that and to look keep uh, look and keep our eyes fixed on your son uh, Jesus and his love for us keep us all strong in our faith keep us all filled with hope because you have fulfilled all your promises we pray this all in Jesus name amen all right thank you everyone we'll thank continue you. more uh, lessons of the day next uh, next Sunday the Sunday after